I'm after a velocity of money, so I'm trying to get in and out quick. If we could do twenty thousand dollars paint, carpet, backsplash, you know, throw some granite counters in there, maybe paint the cabinets and throw some hardware on. I'm gonna want to do that rehab. In my experience, the larger the budgets, a lot of times, the more often the construction can go over in budget as well. Welcome to the Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast, brought to you by the Rental Property Owner Association, providing benefits and services to real estate investors and rental property owners for over 48 years. With your host, Brian Hamrick from Hamrick Investment Group. This episode is sponsored by Green Property Management, managing everything from single family homes to apartment complexes in the West Michigan area. Find out more at greenpropertymgt.com. And RCBN Associates, helping real estate investors and small business owners navigate the complex world of health insurance and Medicare benefits at rcbassociatesllc.com. Hello and welcome to episode 139. Like a lot of you listening to this show, my guest today, Dan Breslin, started investing in real estate after reading Robert Kiyosaki's Rich Dad, Poor Dad. The only difference was that he read it shortly after getting out of prison. Dan was able to scrape together $5,000, and 12 years later, he's now the founder and president of Diamond Equity Investments, a real estate investment company flipping properties in Philadelphia, Chicago, Atlanta, Miami, and Tampa. Dan averages 25 deals per month, and he focuses on wholesale deals. Dan's also an expert on funding, fixing, and flipping dozens of real estate deals a month. Dan, welcome to the show. Thanks, Brian. It's good to be here. You have a very interesting background. And, and of, of course, the fact that, that you were in prison and uh, read Robert Kiyosaki's Rich Dad, Poor Dad, that, that's where I'd like to start because that, that's really interesting. Well, it was like the Vikings when they burned the boats on the shores in order not to surrender, run away, et cetera, and make sure they were committed to the cause. Um, I was more partying like a Viking uh, early in my life, in my 20s there, and I ended up blacked out, uh, waking up in a jail cell and being informed that I had joyrided somebody's car, crashed it, and uh, and then had to pay the price for that. So that was back in 2004, 2005. I spent that year paying the price for that. And it was actually during that time while I was sitting in the, the big open room cell, which is about 100 people living in bunk beds and a giant contain locked unit if you will uh rich dad poor dad came down the you know down the uh the block it was being passed around most people didn't care about that book uh or books at all in general in that population but uh it, my back was against the wall i used to sell cars i had done some electrical contracting bouncing around you know early on trying a lot of different things trying to figure out what was for me uh, so I couldn't go back to selling cars with that kind of a history that had to be disclosed anymore, n not to mention the fact that I didn't have a driver's license when I came home. And uh, we ended up going to one of those get rich quick in real estate seminars we all have heard on the radio or seen on TV. And we paid. My dad put the credit cards up. I was blown away because he's not he didn't have money. He had to use the credit card to send me off to these expensive seminars that uh, I'm sure a lot of the listeners have either done, know about, uh, you know, or f felt like it was a scam. It did work for me. Um, I ended up with a lot of knowledge out there that allowed me to do my first couple deals and to talk knowledgeably and build contacts with people um, in the investment business around my area there in Philadelphia when I came home. Uh, I, I didn't really intend like, hey, we're going to do real estate. When I was sitting in jail, my dad kind of was like, we'll figure something out for you. You know, getting a job's tough. You you know, you got this conviction now and I'm not, I don't know what it's going to be, but we'll find something. And uh, six or seven months later is when I did the first deal that I had a contract for $5,500 in a very, very rough part of town. And I ended up selling the deal three weeks later before I even had to come up with the $5,500 for eleven thousand five hundred dollars that was about 12 years ago it was like almost this time of year july uh, 2006 that that deal went to settlement and it was a clean six thousand dollar profit and that was the most money i had ever seen in such a short period of time uh you know the biggest check that was ever written out to me for sure at that time and it was a, a very much a life-changing experience Wow. So you, you were able to use real estate to really turn things around. Now, now I've got an episode I've recorded. By the time your episode comes out, it will have aired. It's on returning citizens. Um, 
uh, people who have been in the prison population and, and entering back into society. And, and really the episode is kind of focused on uh, landlords who will rent to them and just their ability to find uh, housing or even jobs for that matter. Uh, what I, I'd imagine, you know, being a you, returning citizen yourself, you probably faced some of those issues. Um, do, you, do you mind, before we get into the real estate stuff, just talking about those types of <clears throat> obstacles that you had to overcome? So I did. And uh, when I, in 2005, had to do that time in jail, my daughter was, I don't know, two or three years old and her mom moved with their family out to Chicago uh, during that year. So then being a dad became like back and forth on the plane or driving or whenever I could afford to visit her. Uh, but it was certainly not ideal. I'm sure anybody with kids could imagine the, you know, 700 miles distance between your kids for visits. So I always had this dream of moving to Chicago and I tried a couple times to move out here and reestablish the real estate business that I was, you know, that I had in Philadelphia and Chicago. And I failed a couple times. And, uh, you know, one of the, one of the reasons was that I couldn't go out and find any kind of a decent job with that, um, you know, conviction on my record with having a history, um, even trying to rent places and things of that nature. But in 2015, um, I believe in God. I believe that sometimes there's things that there's it's impossible for me to plan or put together, uh, you know, the right situation. And I, I moved to a condo right on the water in Chicago here, and he never even checked my history or anything. I wrote him the check. And then, you know, we kind of like after I moved in, I had to fill out the condo application paperwork and nothing was ever said. So I don't know if nothing showed up, you know, if, if they had it show up, but he just felt good about it anyway. Um, he never even asked up front, you know, whether I had that uh, a criminal history or anything like that. So, I mean, I had to sweat, you know, wondering if that was going to take place. And since then, I bought another condo on the water and just disclosed it to the association, wrote it down on there. And, and it's been, I guess, more than 10 years for me. So it's probably a different situation in somebody who had come home, uh, you know, in the past year is going to be definitely uh, faced with more challenges that I'm faced with now at this point. But uh, it's it's definitely, when I say like uh, the Vikings had to burn the boats, I didn't have the opportunity, Brian, to go back to being an architect or, you know, being an engineer. That's what I went to school for a couple of years, never finished. Uh, I didn't have anything that was a substantial, livable wage type of job to return to. So I had to make real estate work. There was no other option for me. I have a lot of failures in real estate. I have had broke years in real estate. And, you know, by the grace of God, the last, you know, five, six years or so since 2012 have been uh, increasing, 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 increasing. Yeah, a lot of options that are open to, to so many people were just not open to you. But you were able to turn it around through real estate. And you mentioned that you went to one of the seminars where you pay, pay and you learn the, the, the techniques and it worked for you. Tell us what techniques you followed and, and what seminar you went to? There's a couple seminars. So you have the teaser seminar that we went to on a Tuesday night and they sell you on the weekend where you're going to learn everything. And that was like a thousand or two thousand bucks, whatever it was. And I remember the, the guy described the deal. He said, yeah, I got this deal. And I was a piece of land and wherever the guy was from Florida or South Carolina or something. It was a Russ Whitney seminar for everybody who's wondering. Um, and I'm, I'm happy with it. I would still give them a good testimonial video today if they asked me, uh, especially today if they asked me. Um, but he described a deal where he found this lot or whatever it was for $20,000 and he found a buyer for, I don't know, 30 or $40,000 and he put the check on the screen and he described quickly a wholesale deal and how it went down and, and the light bulb went off immediately. Oh my God, I can do this. This is like, you know, simple. I get it. I understand. Um, so we went to the weekend seminar. They sell us on, you know, the next level of training, which was like five advanced classes scattered throughout the U.S. It included track. I had to, you know, come up with the money for the travel, the plane tickets, you know, hotel rooms. We partnered with a guy in the weekend seminar. My dad stepped back. He sent me off with this other guy whose wife stayed back. And then we were like kind of going to these advanced training classes because we split the cost on that. Uh, sixteen or eighteen thousand dollar package at the time. My dad split the cost on that. Um, some of those were like lease options, subject to rent to own was one class. Uh, I did not ever take the wholesaling class. One was Millionaire University, which was a lot of basic business structure. Uh, you know, deducting business expenses, uh, 
CRA plans with banks, Community Reinvestment Act, being able to approach the right lender, just a lot of different uh, raising money was a part of the Millionaire University course. Just a lot of different things that put the vocabulary in my mouth. So when I came around the networking events back in Philadelphia, back home, I had to get a ride by my dad and dropped off uh, at the networking event. And the guy who met me there and told me about it, you know, like I meet him and he was like a mover and shaker. He introduced me around to people. So people thought like, wow, this this kid, you know, I was 26 years old at the time. This kid must be a mover and shaker too if he's hanging with that guy. And like, you know, 12 years later, that, that guy's one of my business partners in Philadelphia market still to this day. He's been a lender. We've done, you know, at least 100 deals together since that point in time. But uh, having this, you know, the vocabulary made me come off as somebody who was at least, I, I think I seemed more years in the business than I actually was at the time, three or four months because of taking that advanced uh, training, getting access to a lot of different things that take people years and years of uh, research and figuring out on their own to get to. So you were able to network and, and form some key relationships early on. Um, and I know you, you went into uh, some detail about the first deal that you did, um, but can you just kind of describe your, your mindset in the beginning there and, and how, like any fears that you might have had in doing that first deal? Well, yeah, I mean, my I think we looked at the property and then had to like circle back to make the offer. And I, I didn't know how much to offer on the property, which is a big problem. It took me, I mean, I personally was, you know, several years, if not 10 years in the business or something like, like an astronomical, it may not have been 10, it may have been like seven before I started to get a grasp on being able to comp the deals and quickly determine how much to offer. Um, part of my business, Brian, is being in so many markets or being in a very wide market where I have to analyze a lot of different pieces of the market and get it at least somewhat right to make money on the deal. But early on, I didn't know how much to offer for this property. The area was a drug infested trap. Uh, I remember we, we brought my daughter like to the house and she was playing with the granddaughter. Like had no, I had no notion as to how, um, how rough that neighborhood was when we went there. I'd never gone there before that in my life. Uh, it's very, very interesting. But uh, so I, I should have probably had fear for my safety at the time, but I, I didn't have that. Uh, my fear was offering the wrong amount of money, like too much money for the house. And so I saw that a friend of mine had at, that I met at the networking event offered six thousand on a property around the corner, and I offered five thousand five hundred, thinking to myself, make five hundred bucks. Uh, by selling it to him. If he bought that one for 6000 I get mine for 5500 It's a better deal, and I can make the difference. So I call him up after I get the contract. I say, yeah, yeah, I saw you bought the one on Remington Street for $6,000. I said, yeah, Remington Street? Oh, and I told him about my deal. Oh, no, no, Dan. Uh, I'll give you mine for 5500 bucks. Mine's on Remington Street, and they named it because I think of the white body chalk lines out front on my steps every time I go down to collect the rent and all the Remington shell cases that are laying around on the street. I'm like, oh, my God, what did I get myself into? But uh, my only mistake there was not taking him up on his offer of 5500 immediately and contracting the property because my buyer, who I sold mine for 11500 ended up buying his on Remington Street a few months later for around the same money, probably the ten, eleven thousand dollars $11,000. So I left money on the table there on that uh, first early one for my lack of experience. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about green property management. Not only do they manage everything from single family homes to apartment complexes in the West Michigan area, they also manage my entire portfolio. So I can tell you from personal experience that their unique flat fee management style is worth a closer look. If you feel that your property isn't operating to its fullest potential, then green property management can help you take a holistic approach that will save you money, eliminate your headaches, and increase your net income. And if you're a property manager interested in applying green property management's model, give them a call at 1-866-95-GREEN or visit them on the web at greenpropertymgt.com. Just to remind us, so you picked that first one up for 5500 and you sold it for 11500 Correct. Tell us then, I mean, you get that the wind under your sails there after doing that first deal. Um, where'd you take it from there? 
the ad in the newspaper, which is something that some listeners may not even remember, um, used to produce good leads when people would read the newspaper. Um, it was a few hundred bucks a month. And in those early days, I would run, I ran almost my entire business from that newspaper ad. We would do a deal a month or so uh, out of that ad. It was like the best kept, kept secret for me, you know, early on. Everyone's wondering where I'm getting all these deals. Uh, <laughs> um, so I kept the ad running. I did a second deal in that same town and got lucky looking back, you know, the market was hot and somebody bought it and I made eight, nine thousand dollars on something that, you know, today, knowing what I know now, that deal shouldn't have closed and still shouldn't close. No one should pay that kind of money for that property, but they did. And then the third deal, I run into that same guy who introduced me around the networking event and uh He's like, yeah, you got anything cooking? And I'm like, yeah, some guy wants to sell me a burned down house in Chester. And, and I'm like, you know, joking about this guy's trying to sell me this burned down. Chester was the town where I did the first two deals. And he like tilts his head up and looks up sort of, you know, at an angle. He's like, I think I have a buyer for that. So like, you know, I think it was like $17,000 profit later after we sold our burned down house in Chester. Uh, then the fourth deal I did, I sold to him. The fifth deal he funded me on, it was a rehab. Uh, we did a 50, 50 split and it was like a whole tail. We sold quick and I think it was a six deal. He just lent me the money straight up. Uh, so that was the first six deals and that all happened within, you know, six months, five months of that first deal closing. So then after that, it was a matter of, you know, a lot of partnerships, a lot of deals, a lot of details that just add up. So in that first six months, did you reach a point where you were making enough money to, to basically, you know, keep yourself afloat and, and, and have a decent income? Yeah, I think I made 40,000 or give or take uh, between July and December. So for me at the time, that was, you know, the best, that was tracking for the best money that I ever made. You know, I was able to get a car and ended up buying a house, like not that same year, but a little bit later, uh, I guess uh, the following year. So yeah, it was, it was a life-changing experience. It finally put me in a place where I was able to pay all my bills, my credit cards, you know, just just pay everything, have money for the, the child support, for the business back and forth to Chicago, all of that. It was life changing for sure. And and this was around 2006, right? Correct. And, and of course you were heading into the, the Great Recession and I'm kind of obsessed with how people were able to survive during the Great Recession. Um, you're, you're getting this new business and real estate off the ground. Things are going great. W what happened then? I think I probably could have weathered that storm had I not regressed back into the Viking partying and drinking kind of lifestyle a little bit. So like I made a lot of money. It was $90,000, $100,000 after that in like a three month period, something like that. Uh, a year later, it kind of made me feel like I had the Midas touch, uh, to be completely honest. And uh, so I was kind of you know, hanging out in the bars and the clubs and all that kind of stuff. And and so like I kind of personally ran myself with my bad habits, I think, into the ground, if you will, and sort of had to start back over from scratch. So in 2011, I picked up the Bible and I picked up myself by the bootstraps and I got my habits right and, you know, haven't had a drink since since then. Uh, and, and really started living right and just give my life back to God. And since that point in 2011, uh, that ironically seems to be the same time as the economy in the United States was rebuilding itself back up from its bad habits. But I was doing the same in my personal life and growing, reading books, doing deals uh, and just putting the pieces together in much better, higher fashion. Maybe some of it's just maturity. Uh, for me, a lot of it's it's just a blessing from God. If you are thinking of leaving your W-2 job and becoming a full-time real estate investor, one of the greatest costs you must consider is health care for you and your family. When I made this transition five years ago, I found the whole health care insurance process to be confusing and frustrating. That's why I'm glad I met Chad Creasy at RCB & Associates. Chad is a professional health insurance agent who helps real estate investors and small business owners understand and choose their best health care options. And best of all, his services are covered by the insurance company and won't cost you a dime. If you're expecting a change in your health care insurance coverage for any reason, then you owe it to yourself to contact Chad Creasy at rcbassociatesllc.com. So you were able to, to kind of pull it back together. You, you burned the Viking boats, but the Vikings rebuilt the boats. Uh, you got back into that lifestyle. Uh, uh, you know, found, found God, and and pulled it back together 
Um, did that kick your business, your real estate business into higher gear? It did. Uh, it became, you know, I started to figure out like the systems, how to build business, how to be a marketer, uh, start studying business models, um, reading biographies of, you know, anyone from Warren Buffett to John Rockefeller to Andrew Carnegie to the list goes on to the number of people who we would recognize. Uh, of course, Steve Jobs, lots of, I love business biographies, especially, you know, people who've made it to like what we all in the media would call astounding heights or remarkable careers. Uh, there's a lot of lessons there in believability. What, what were some of those lessons that, that you learned from those books that, that you've applied to your business? So in John Rockefeller's instance, I think that there were some very unobjective um, things and people who attacked him and, and wrote about him and vilified him and, uh, you know, especially with some of the antitrust stuff and turn him to, into being like kind of a villain. But it, the uh, I can't remember what the name of that one is. Um, the biography was written, in my opinion, objectively. So they acknowledged a lot of those, you know, antitrust uh, monopoly style tactics. But then on the flip side, you know, the people who did end up selling the businesses to him, a lot of them would stay involved in the business. So he would buy businesses the same way that Facebook would buy Instagram and founders would stay on if they so choose for a period of time uh, so they can remain purposeful. But, uh, you know, those people ended up creating bigger opportunities than they even had then. So for me, it was the question of how can I create a bigger opportunity for the people that are in my business and my partners and my network? How can I continue to expand this thing that we have that we're all working on together? And that's one of the questions that I've driven myself with since I read that uh, book. And I think that, I mean, I know for a fact that I have a lot of people on my team who are living a much better life today as a result of, you know, the efforts that we have all collectively put in together. But that was one of the lessons as an example that I took from John Rockefeller's style of business creation. So how, how do you then take that idea that you learned from John uh, Rockefeller's uh, uh, biography and, and put that into real life practice? Um, I have partners on every deal. Uh, so I'll have a partner in a city and I'm going to go 50 50 on the business in that city with the, that partner. So I'm generating the marketing, you know, this person typically comes to me and doesn't have the money to sustain themselves in the business or to figure out the years of lessons. It took me to figure out uh, from negotiating the deals, from analyzing the market, from the approach of how we sell the property, whether it's a fix and flip, whether it's a fund the deal. So I bring a lot of those pieces to the table and I could probably operate and have a real estate REO broker go into that situation, make the offer, and I could close on the deal and pay a lot less than a partnership split 50-50 with that person. Um, so by the time I add my marketing expenses and overhead into my 50%, I end up with you know somewhere in the 20 to 25% range. Uh, and the partner will eventually, as we grow in a city, to a place where we have something like 47 deals under contract in Chicago right now, they have a lot of overhead with, you know, some staff members that, that they're responsible to oversee and, and work with and pay out of their portion uh, as well. So, so for me, it was, you know, early on, if I have a scarcity mentality and there's like one deal on the table, like I kind of want to just go the REO broker route, pay this guy 6%, he goes, makes an offer, or give him like two, $3,000 to oversee construction, basically keep most of the profit for myself and structure my business that way. Whereas for me, it was a little bit of a scary thing early on in Philadelphia and when it was just me running out to living rooms making the deals uh, to want to keep all of the profit for myself but instead bring people on who I'm covering my expenses and they're taking 50% of the profit and those were like very large windfall life-changing amounts of money for those partners at the time in Philadelphia um, and it was a hard decision for me to kind of like, okay, this is what has to happen. Let me trust this and let me give up half of my deals here in the goal of eventually scaling up and being able to not have to be present in the living room in Philadelphia so that I could eventually move to Chicago, which I did do, which is where I live today, so that I could be close to my daughter. 
So let's break it down into kind of the nitty gritty of who's doing what. And let's let's start with your partner. So you, because you're in multiple cities um, and obviously you can't be traveling back and forth all the time between all these properties. So you need the, the partners on the ground. And it sounds like you're willing to give them a, a larger piece of the pie. Uh, it, you know, provided they can perform and help you scale. What exactly do you expect of your partners? What do they uh, accomplish for you? It's important for the partners to kind of have an undivided attention for my business. So this is not something that I, first of all, I'm not looking to have partners in every city. I'm not on the lookout to, you know, be in every market. I'm in those five markets that I'm in right now. I've tried to go into a couple others and failed. And so my attention span, and at least the way my business is set up right now, I'm looking at every lead, I'm pricing every deal. I may not make the pricing on every offer, especially as my business partners become better at analyzing the market. Usually it takes about a year, two years, unless they were already in the real estate business before that. Um, so I'm I'm not you know looking to expand beyond much of what I have now, just because of the the time and the quality of life that it would cost. And I don't think that I would be as successful in those new markets either. Uh, so they have to go out to the living room, negotiate with sellers, you know, handle buyers, go to the closing tables. Sometimes, oftentimes, there's holding companies set up in my partner's name. So they're closing out our rehabs uh, in their name. They're managing construction on those projects in their name. Like when it starts off, we do a deal or two or three or however many, just like those first ones, Brian, early on, when it was like, we didn't rehab it, we didn't have to fund it and all that. But as we grow in the market, we're funding deals. We're having, you know, those partners are meeting with private lenders that I've set up, you know, lunches from. Like, I'm not going to fly in every time someone's trying to invest a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars in our, you know, in one of our rehabs in our company. It's not uh, economic or, you know, feasible with the amount of time it would take for me to travel and meet with every uh, lender. So my my operating partners, who are the ones on the ground, who are actually operating deals, who actually are my exclusive partners are the ones that are going to be interfacing often with my private lender uh, network and community. Um, so they're, you know, they're managing the day to day stuff on the ground. I'm continuing to generate the leads. I'm continuing to put uh, the opportunities in front of my partners. And, you know, 90 percent of our deals come from our own marketing efforts. And we do about 10 percent from like referrals from agents, referrals from people in our network, sometimes buyers or wholesalers that are also listening to my podcast or on my you know buyers list will bring me deals as well hey dan i got this the buyer flaked on us and we'll close it out in like a day or two so that's mostly what they're responsible for so and and just to be clear i want to i want to make sure um i i understand fully you're you're on the ground partners they're they're the ones who are negotiating with the the homeowners who might be selling their home or or uh, whoever might uh, have control of the, the property. They're uh, assessing whether you should just wholesale it or do a, a rehab and flip. Um, uh, I'm going to assess what happens with every deal. Typically, sometimes you know the decision is made by accident and they're moving too quick, and maybe we wholesale something that should have been flipped. But uh, ultimately, we we kind of decide that together. And I'm looking at every deal that we have under contract to determine what's going to be our highest and best use. Some of the stuff we're going to hold it, uh, you know, because it's in an area of gentrification where the properties are moving up in value fast enough. I've paid retail price for occupied rental properties, um, you know, in neighborhoods. We hold them for a year or two years and then resell them and, and harvest our profit. Then these are deals we wouldn't have been able to make. They would have made no sense. They didn't make any sense uh, when we bought them. We felt like we were overpaying. So we'll, we'll go in a variety of directions, and I'm also included on that decision. So are those your three main strategies? You, you, may, you might hold it, you might wholesale it, or you might uh, rehab it and then flip it? I think that's probably safe to say, yeah. Okay. And, and then what determines which strategy you go with? Well, as far as the rehabs go, I depending on which city it is, we might do more or less construction. I'm... I'm I'm, I'm after a velocity of money, so I'm trying to get in and out quick. Uh, if we could do $20,000 paint, carpet, backsplash, you know, throw some granite counters in there, maybe paint the cabinets and throw some hardware on, uh, I'm going to want to do that rehab. You know, if I could do that, clean it up, 
resell it to somebody as opposed to sixty, seventy thousand dollars new kitchen, new baths, new windows, new air condition, HVAC system. Uh, it's just the amount of time that's necessary, and, and in my experience, the larger the budgets, a lot of times, um, more uh, more often the construction can go over in budget as well on some of those larger ones. Uh, so, so I guess the speed at which we can get in and out of the deal is going to be important. But you know, the buy and hold option, what's going to determine that is: is this property something that's going to double in value in the next seven years? What about the funding of, of these deals? So it sounds like you're working both with, with lenders, both private and, and then possibly institutional, and then also uh, private investors as well. We fund a lot of our deals with our own cash at this point. I am not just in business with people to have them go off and do their own thing. I don't restrict any of their money by any means. But a big part of being in business with me is, you know, we're all of the same philosophy. So, you know, 90 percent of my team may have not started out with uh, gym, going to the gym, as an example, eating healthy, as an example, uh, not smoking cigarettes, as an example. Like we definitely don't have. Uh, at least to my knowledge, like most of us are going to church. Most of us are believing in God. Most of us are, we're, we're kind of of the same cloth. And a lot of us have, you know, not necessarily started there, but like saving your money is important. Being ready for the next opportunity is important. So like no one on my team is riding around in a Bentley because they, they can afford the Bentley, but they're not riding around the Bentley because they know we need that cash sitting on the sidelines to, you know, take advantage of the next deal. So that's basically our first place is using our own cash. And then our second place is going to be uh, using some private investment capital. So we have a network of people. They sign up to receive emails when we send those deals out. We pay 10 percent interest. Whether we have the money uh, is calculated on a yearly basis. So we have a 10% mortgage annualized interest. We might have, you know, on a, a big fix and flip where we do do seventy, eighty thousand dollars in rehab, we may have that money for seven, eight, nine months. Uh, some of the deals we're going to wholesale out quickly, and our investors like those, and we'll pay a 90 day or three month minimum interest payment to them. So, like a lot of times, we might close, borrow $120,000. Uh, and have the money for five or six weeks from the time we close on the deal, we'll clean the deal out, then we'll resell the deal to another investor who's going to step in and, and do the renovation. Um, and we pay them off in six weeks. Well, when they do the math, they're making out much better than the 10% because the money's available again to be placed in another investment in a short period of time, but it paid out three months minimum of interest. Um, so those are the two main places. We have some lines of credit and things of that nature, but the, the two main places are our own cash and private investment capital. And, and it sounds like you have some some pretty high standards for the people you do business with. You know, in real estate, you get all types of people. So I'm just wondering, how do you do due diligence then on, on your partners uh, in order to find the, the type of people that you want to work with? We typically aren't running ads. You know, we're not putting out stuff like on Facebook to find people. So a lot of times these people sort of crop crop up, bubble up to the top, cream of the crop kind of from our networks already. So I run a real estate investor networking group in Chicago. Uh, we meet only once a quarter. This is not a monthly thing. We used to do that every month, but it got to be too much work for us uh, putting on the event. So so my podcast and i wrote a book on wholesaling that a lot of people will find that you know then find the podcast or vice versa find the podcast and find the book they read that they spend time listening to the podcast and i'm sure you re you've had the same experience brian where people get to know how you know brian hamrick they, they know how you think because they're uh, an audience member of the podcast and they've listened to the questions you ask and your ideas and that's what has been the best source of people for me was people who listen to my podcast, spend time with that. Uh, Austin Stack, who's my vice president, you know, business partner in Atlanta, uh, he came through my podcast. He showed up at the networking event. He was trying to wholesale me listed real estate properties. He sent me stuff that the banks had listed. Here, here's a deal. And he like adds 5,000 to it or something. Just totally didn't understand the 
you know, the, the, how the business worked. I'm not going to buy the property from him and just pay him a premium, you know. He uh, he ended up just continuing to add value to me and he'd make connections. Hey, this guy's trying to sell his house. You know, he ended up moving from Chicago to Atlanta to work for another guy in a real estate business uh, selling wholesale deals. Hey, this is my buyer's list from Chicago. He would send me the email. Let me, you know, I didn't ask for anything in return. It was not like a tit for tat. He wasn't saying, hey, here's my buyer's list. And, you know, if you sell something to one of these guys, I want to get paid. It was like there was no other motive. He didn't have any idea in the world that I was going to want to be in business with him. There was no, you know, it, that was not his intention, but I noticed he kept adding value. I noticed he was the kind of guy that seemed like I would want to be in business with him with good habits and just a good overall attitude. And the fact that I had identified Atlanta as a place that I wanted to be in business with. So it was kind of like a match made in heaven. And uh, he came back up to Chicago to meet with his dad. He, you know, he had family here. We had lunch and I put the idea in front of him for Atlanta and you know we did like one million dollars in the first 14 months that we were there that's that's profit that we split 50 50 and there was a little bit of expenses you know I had my 20 25 percent but we, we made really good money in Atlanta that first year or so uh, so it's hard to say and I'm not building a system to do due diligence and to attract new people but when the people we have other stories just like Austin's where they came through my podcast it, and you know, came to the networking event and they always sort of come forward through the network and all of a sudden we're kind of doing some deals together and it just naturally seems to fit that the people who we're working with together today sort of gravitate to the circle and just sort of start. It was never really uh, defined necessarily, most of the people on the team, how it was going to go. Well, it does seem interesting um, from our conversation here. It's, it's evident that one of your talents is creating key relationships with, with people that, that can be long term and you know financially very successful. Uh, you know whether it be after you got out of prison and you, you took the, uh, the the seminars that you paid for and you met you know a key person then in your in your investment uh, to the the podcast that you host and the people that it's introducing you to. Um, is there a certain way that you're relating to people that that is is bringing that into your life? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it probably so, you know, early on, I met some people and I jumped out of some partnerships probably early. I was a little bit greedy in my mindset, thinking that I could do the whole business on my own. and I didn't need anyone else. I mean, there was a lot of other stuff going on, too, with those partnerships. But for me, when people are in my life a lot now, I've learned that, you know, God places people in your life sometimes, you know, for a season or for a reason, uh, or maybe for the long term. But like, if God joins me to someone else, and I jump out of that situation, he might have had, you know, a, another plan down the line, if I had stayed the course. And so I'm hesitant to get out of, you know, jump out of relationships or cast people aside, like, you know, if, if you knew that God handpicked somebody to be in your life, would you treat that relationship with disdain? And I think that's how I approach my relationships in life. And I don't have an unlimited amount of time, so I do my best to maintain all the relationships. But I definitely, you know, I, I treat people like, like they were divinely placed in my life. Um, and I don't try to hold on to people, you know, too long or make something with somebody uh, more than it was. Sometimes it's just a brief interaction and we all keep moving. Uh, but when we are supposed to do things together, I, I do invest the time in those relationships to build those relationships and just to grow them uh, so that we can, like, maybe it's a person I'm supposed to create the opportunity for. Um, you know, I, I don't really have it defined way other than I just kind of know that's the right person at the time. Let's talk about your side of the business. What is it you're bringing to the equation here? I construct the websites. I construct the marketing systems. I do the lead generation um, for everything. I also evaluate market data and a lot of these uh, negotiations I'm participating in. So I found that I got good at being behind the computer and figuring out how much a property would sell for quickly as a wholesale price. And a lot of people don't really understand that. Um, and when I was able to make sure that I no longer had to drive out to the appointments and, and run all over, I was able to leverage my experience in being in the business 12 years 
and looking at comps in five different, you know, major MSA markets here um, around the country. So I was able to spot ways to make money and see opportunities to really press our advantage in some situations. We had a deal um, to give you an example of exactly what I'm talking about and the value that I'm bringing to the table. We had a deal in Atlanta where we wanted it for 290,000 and sellers like, no, there's no way we're selling that. And, you know, Austin kept working that in Atlanta and he ended up bringing a guy to the table who builds in the neighborhood, whatever, a buyer. Sometimes you come back in, you don't really know how much to offer. You get your buyer to tell you how much he would offer. Then you go back to the seller and you build in a small profit. So the buyer says, hey, I'll pay 400,000 for this thing. And we just didn't see the value in it. Like we couldn't, we never would have guessed someone would pay 400 for that property. Uh, and then we go back to the seller and they agree to 390. And then we go back to the other guy and I'm like, hey man, would you go up to 410 for us? We think that, you know, 20, K for finding a deal. We think that's a fair profit. And the guy's like, nah, yeah, no. Nah. We decide we're going to send it out to our list. And he said, go ahead, send it out to the list. We send it out to the list at 430. We get like five or six people interested. It's a really desirable area uh, called Brookhaven, north of Atlanta, in the suburbs there, where people buy a property for half a million, maybe spend 300,000, put a new second floor on and sell them for 900 to $1.2 million. Um, it is outside of our normal operating and uh, deal analysis. But anyway, we get the the offer there and some guy corners Austin at the show and says, ah, I'll give you, you know, 430 right now. And, and a guy, Austin's like, we don't lock anything up on the spot. And the guy's like, well, what's your number to lock it up? And he's like, oh, I don't know, 460. And the guy's like, I'll do it. You got to sign now. So he calls me and I had just been part of a bidding war in another market. So I realized and recognized that, like, you know, all of a sudden we might have underpriced and have a really hot deal on our plate. So I told Austin to get back out of the car and turn down the $460,000 offer. Let the, let the guy know that we already have offers at, that, at about that same price um, and we're expecting even higher. So he should go back and just let us know what his highest and best is by the end of the day. Uh, we end up getting offers at five hundred and five and five hundred and twenty five thousand dollars for that property, which we ended up accepting the five twenty five. Um, but you know, we could have turned down and accepted, and a lot of people would have accepted four thirty or even four hundred or four ten from the first guy. Um, and we had a hundred and ten or so thousand dollar you know gross profit on that deal. Uh, and the ironic part, Brian, the the agent who brought us the buyer for the 525 was the same guy who offered the 400 and didn't want to lock it up at 410. So he ended up, you know, <laughs> really having to go uh, to a whole nother level there as a result of like, sometimes we can, negotiation is a gift and a curse, Brian. We can sometimes negotiate ourselves out and be just a little too greedy, a little, want a little too much, push a little too much, and then we don't get the deal and it ends up costing us, you know, 95 extra thousand dollars in that case. Uh, but it worked out that time. Do you have examples of, of times when you may have lost money and the, uh, the lessons you learned from that? Yeah, actually, you know, the same bidding war that taught me the lesson. I was buying a property of my own and I forget what the numbers were. I bid above asking price, I think 40 or $50,000 above asking price. And the lesson that I learned from that, I ended up, it was a property I was going to buy for 350,000 or so, I forget what it was, 310 maybe, and I was gonna put 350 in it, and it was worth like nine something, and I was gonna move in, but then I fell out of love with being on a street. I can like look out my condo as I'm speaking to you, and I see the beach, and it's across the water, and I have balconies all the way around, and I just couldn't imagine myself living somewhere without the water out the window here. Like we had, it's like living on the ocean. The Great Lakes are 118 miles wide here. Uh, you can't see the other side. Um, so I bought that property, couldn't imagine living in it, sold it and took about a 10 to 20,000, somewhere in there, net loss on that property when I sold it. But the lesson I learned there was that people will pay $50,000 over the asking price because I just did it. And I do 50, 60 deals, 70 deals a month sometimes. And here I am, the professional real estate investor, getting emotionally charged up and having the fear of loss and bidding up a property that I ended up selling it. If I didn't do the architectural drawings and plans, I probably could have sold that property and still made more money. I didn't even list the property on the MLS. I just kind of sold it quietly to another developer and I needed the money for another deal. So I was, I was willing to take the quick 
you know, quick loss there to get out of that property. But the lesson that I learned in bidding up was the same lesson that was applied in the other market in Atlanta that did end up making me that extra, you know, uh, our team went from, you know, the $10,000 assignment to $110,000 gross profit on that deal with that same lesson. You know, getting back to the, the, the marketing that you do to find leads, what, what tips do you have for our listeners on, on doing that to find good leads? I, I mean, that's hard to say because there's years of improvement. Um, you have to do it. You just have to find some lists and start marketing to them. I mean, probate lists are good. If you can get your hands on those, you can go to listsource.com and get high equity lists. Um, for me, I want properties that have equity wherever I'm going to be buying because of the fact that uh, it's just a lot easier. I can't really get a good deal if they owe, you know, 95% of it, some FHA mortgage. It doesn't really behoove anybody to go out there and be in that living room. Uh, whereas also a lot of times the high equity lists and probate houses, these are like the houses that we typically buy, Brian, I'm paying a fair price for these houses. They're hoarder houses. They need a renovation. So yeah, sometimes we get lucky on like that Brookhaven deal and that's like 100000 That was totally out of left field. We had no idea that that was going to take place in, in that deal. Um, most of our deals don't really fit for a, a retail buyer to live there. Um, they don't they don't really feel like we're paying a fair price. Even if they went on the MLS, they listed whatever the case is, like our cash offer is going to be the best fit. And so if you're going to go out and be prepared to pay cash for a property and deal directly with sellers, you want to make sure that it's going to be a good fit. And the high equity list that's been owned for a long time, someone's owned that property 20, 30, 40 years, they paid it off 10, 15, 20 years ago. A lot of those properties haven't been improved and you know have a high likelihood of needing a renovation in order to be retail ready so those are going to be you know a good match for us real estate investors who want to invest capital in improving the property uh and buy the property at a fair price so that we have a good equity position if we're going to hold them for a rental property over the long term or to resell those properties immediately and, and harvest a profit within a year or so as we wrap it up here, Dan, I want to take the conversation back to when you were in prison and ask you if there are any lessons you learned while you were there, things that you picked up that apply to what you're doing now. Yeah, I mean, every Sunday I went down to church in there. Uh, and when I didn't have all the distractions of life, it was very easy, even in 2006, to you know, listen and pay attention to God, to the universe for the instructions on how to live my life, if you will. Uh, I believe that, you know, you can you can kind of hear the right thing or, or hear the good ideas if you're quiet enough and you're removing up distractions. And that worked well for me until I invited the distractions back in in 2009, 10, 11. And then when I pushed them back out again, you know, it was an application of that same lesson. Um, you know, I picked I picked the Bible up and that was one of the books I was reading when I was in prison and I picked it back up and read it cover to cover and still read it on an almost daily basis. A couple of different, um, you know, books in there uh, still to this day. One of the cool things that actually a mentor taught me, not when I was in prison, but I think it's important, but there's 31 books in the book of Proverbs and it was written by mostly King Solomon, who was, uh, you know, alleged to be the, the wealthiest person king person in history, um, depending on who's telling the story. And each day can coordinate with each day of the month. So today is July 31st and I'll read Proverbs 31. And it's kind of like a business book with a lot of um, knowledge and lessons there. So the mentor told me, look, do this for five years and you'll be a, a millionaire by the end of the fifth year if you just read uh, whichever coordinating day of the month it is, the book of Proverbs and that chapter takes you know five minutes. Um, and, and at the end of five years, you'll have, you know, polished up your, your spirit, your approach, your thinking, et cetera, and you'll be a millionaire. It took me two. I didn't do it every day and took about two to get to that place, two years. How can people find out more about you? Uh, you know, mention your book, your podcast, all that. Where, where would you direct people to, to learn more about you? So you can contact me and also download the 165 page book. I wrote that book like my business plan to train up my other business partners. So it was not sugar coated. I'm not selling coaching. There's no ulterior motive there other than I really was trying to duplicate my mindset when I wrote the book. 
uh, and it's called Become a Wholesale Real Estate Master. And if you're buying properties yourself, you can use a lot of those same um, methods and techniques and ideas outlined in that book to buy properties directly from sellers yourself. Or if you're going to wholesale the properties, it's, it's good to get a, a basic primer in the wholesale business. That, along with all of my past podcast episodes, are available at reidiamonds.com. And that stands for Real Estate Investment Jewels of Wisdom. Uh, so you can also check out deals there, contact me, et cetera, uh, everything at that site. Well, Dan, I, I want to thank you for taking the time to just share your experiences with us and you know, enlighten us on, on your methods and strategies of finding good partners and, and doing the wholesaling and the flipping and the, and the rehab and the buy and hold. It's been a very interesting conversation. Thank you. Absolutely, Brian. It's been an honor and a pleasure to be here with you and your listeners. This episode was sponsored by Green Property Management, managing everything from single-family homes to apartment complexes in the West Michigan area. Find out more at greenpropertymgt.com. And RCBN Associates, helping real estate investors and small business owners navigate the complex world of health insurance and Medicare benefits at rcbassociatesllc.com. You've been listening to the Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast, brought to you by the Rental Property Owner Association. You can find out more at rpoaonline.org. If you enjoyed this podcast, please go to iTunes to subscribe, rate, and review. 